Hi there, this is Eric for Ojoy. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at working with the glossy material in Octane for Maya. And so for this video, I'm using the Octane underscore materials underscore 01 dot MA scene. And in this scene, we have a daylight environment lighting the scene. Uh, if we take a look at the render settings, I'm currently using the direct light kernel. And I have a few spheres here. I have the diffuse material applied to this sphere, glossy on this one, specular on this one, metallic on this one, and then on the surface here, I have a mixed material. I just want to focus on the glossy material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a big bar machine here, go to the Octane Render tab, and click on this green icon here to apply a new glossy material. And uh, I'll select one of the objects in the group here, go to the Attribute Editor, and find the Octane Glossy Material tab so that I can see the settings. The first settings that we'll see at the top here are for the diffuse color. So just like the diffuse material, the glossy material also has a diffuse channel. And you could use this to represent base color, diffuse, or albedo, depending on the type of texture you're using or the material you're you're simulating, but those types of textures or colors all go into this slot. Uh, as I lower this, of course, it's going to get darker. Um, and for the moment, it looks a lot like the uh, diffuse material. But as I rotate, you'll see that we do get a nice uh, big specular highlight here. So the glossy material is meant to represent smooth surfaces, smoother than the diffuse material. So smooth, opaque surfaces, such as painted metal, or opaque plastic, or uh, you know things of that nature, you know wood, shiny wood, that kind of stuff. And since you have a diffuse color and a specular intensity here, you can kind of simulate uh, layered materials like uh, a, a colored, brightly colored paint that's also shiny at the same time. Uh, but let's lower this a little bit so we can see the specular highlight a bit better. So if I raise the specular value here, we get more of an intense highlight. You can also put a texture in this channel. Um, in older versions of Octane, you might put a color here to try and simulate a metallic material. So like a bronze material, you might put a yellow color in the specular highlight. However, now that we have the metallic material, um, which we'll cover in another video, the metallic material does a much better job of physically simulating metallic surfaces. So you don't necessarily need to put a color here, but a grayscale texture can do a good job of breaking up this uh, highlight, making it look like a worn material or something that's a bit more realistic. So below specular, we have BRDF model, and we have the roughness and anisotropy settings. So let's first talk about the roughness setting, and then I'll come back to the BRDF model. Um, so as I increase the roughness setting, it spreads out the highlight more and more. Um, the higher this is, the more it becomes like a diffuse material, because as light is hitting the surface, the surface is slightly rough, and that causes light to be reflected in all directions, diffusing the reflection, creating a diffuse reflection. So same thing that we talked about in the previous video on diffuse material. But as we lower this, we get a tighter and tighter highlight. So we bring it all the way down, we get something that's super shiny, representing a very smooth material. Let's bring this up just a little bit though, something like that. Um, and then, of course, you can also put a grayscale texture into roughness. So if I click on this and uh, I'm going to go into the Create Render Node window and find the Octane Float Image Texture. So that's a grayscale texture. And go into my source images for Bar Machine Textures. And I'll use Bar Machine Roughness. So this is the texture that I created in Substance. And you can see how it's breaking up that highlight, creating a nice rough surface or variation of the roughness, making it look a bit more realistic. Let's uh, break that connection for the moment so that we can take a look at anisotropy. So what anisotropy does is it simulates sort of micro grooves on the surface like you might see on a DVD or an old style vinyl record or hair or brushed metal. Anything that has kind of a directionality to the specular highlight um, by you know simulating micro grooves on the surface um, it can be controlled using anisotropy.
Now, if I raise the anisotropy, you would expect that highlight to start to change directions, uh, but it's not. So um, the anisotropy setting is um, tied to the BRDF model. So if I set this to Beckman, nothing happens. I have a high anisotropy here. I'm using a different BRDF model, but the highlight looks the same. So the problem is, is that we need to kind of refresh the preview of the scene. So if I go into the render settings and set frames to pre-cache to one, now we can see that highlight becomes much tighter and you can see it has a directionality to it. So I'll set this back to zero. So the, the problem is, is that um, sometimes this won't update properly and you have to kind of use the frames to pre-cache setting to kind of uh, uh, prompt it to um, update. Uh, it can get really annoying to constantly go into the render settings though. So what I've done is I've created a little shelf button. So if I go into the script editor, you can see that I've created a shelf button that does these two commands, set attribute octane setting dot frames to precache to one and then set it back to zero. So basically I pasted these into the script editor from the, uh, the script history. Then I chose file, save script to shelf, created a shelf button. Now, every time I switch the BRDF model, I can click on that button and it will update. So it just forces the update. So you can see there is a difference between Beckman and GGX that's noticeable in uh, the anisotropic highlight or the way that the anisotropy uh, presents itself. So you can experiment with those two models to get the kind of uh, look that you're going for. Um, I'm going to increase the roughness a little bit more to really spread that highlight out. And then also below anisotropy, we have a rotation slider, which allows me to kind of shift the rotation of the, the uh, micro grooves on the surface, creating that anisotropic highlight or create, changing the direction of that anisotropic highlight. And you can also put a grayscale texture in the rotation. So for example, if I use that same float image texture, that grayscale texture, from roughness in the rotation, you can see I get really interesting looking highlight there because it's affecting the direction. The, the values of the texture are controlling the direction of the highlight itself. So it breaks it up in a really interesting way. Um, so I'll increase the roughness there. And you could use maybe two different textures, one for roughness and one for rotation to get some really interesting looking surfaces. Let's break that connection there and go back to this. And I'm going to bring down the anisotropy a little bit as well as the roughness. And then take a look at sheen. So as I increase sheen, you can see that on the parts of the surface that are kind of facing away from the camera, we're starting to get this color. So if I change this to like green or something like that, it's going to look weird, but you can see that that affects the color of the sheen. So this would be good for simulating kind of a layered material, maybe a dull uh, plastic that has several coats to it. It's just, you know, try and make sure that the roughness of the sheen matches the roughness of the surface in a realistic way. Otherwise you get this, you know, if you have a really tight highlight here, but a really broad sheen, it's going to look really weird. Um, below sheen, of course, we have sheen roughness. So as I increase this, you can see that it's spreading that sheen across the surface a little bit more. So maybe I would want to increase the roughness as well. And maybe decrease the highlight. So you can see now I'm getting something that's kind of interesting. This could be like maybe a dull wood surface. We had a wood grain in there or something like that. Might look pretty good. And the sheen can kind of give it kind of the appearance of dust or some kind of layer on top of everything else. So let's bring the sheen back down to zero and increase that. Now let's bring the roughness down a little bit. Take a look at index of refraction. So uh, index refraction for opaque materials will determine um, the, essentially how reflective the surface is. Uh, so if I set this down to one and let's bring the roughness all the way down and increase the specular highlight and bring the diffuse to black, we get essentially a mirror. So anything below one is gonna give us that same result. But if I set this to say 1.01, .01, we start to get 
a much less reflective material. And as I increase this to say 1.1, 1.2, we start to get more realistic or physically based reflections determined by the index of refraction. So if you're trying to simulate a particular type of material realistically, you can go online. There are plenty of websites that you'll find online that have a list of the index of refraction for a wide variety of different types of material, both opaque and transparent. Um, so the one that I'm looking at here is pixelandpoly.com slash ior.html. It has a nice list here of a wide variety of materials. So it's always a good idea to make sure that you're using a physically based IOR. Um, you also might want to experiment changing the kernel to say path traced or PMC to get a more physically accurate result. So if I switch back to direct light, you can see there's a slight change between direct light and path trace. But depending on the scene and the materials that you're simulating, you might get a much more dramatic um, result. I'll bring up the roughness a little bit and you can see we're getting a nice blurred reflection there. And I'll bring the index of refraction up to like 1.8 or something like that. And you can see we're getting kind of a nice metallic look to it. And then of course you can also play with the anisotropy as well to try and get a brushed metal. I think to get a really good brushed metal, you probably want to have a texture in the rotation to really control the way that it looks. But that's not too bad for like a very brand new aluminum for a quick and dirty one. A texture would probably definitely help out a lot though. And then below the index, we have bump normal and displacement. We discussed those in the previous video on uh, the diffuse material and they kind of work the same way. Uh, we have an opacity slider. Keep in mind that this uh, controls the, the opacity of the entire object and the material, including the specular highlights. So this is not a good way to simulate a transparent material like glass, because you can see the index of refraction has no effect on this. This is just sort of an overall opacity um, in the scene. So you can fade objects in or out. So um, the most realistic use of the opacity setting is to put a, like an alpha um, texture into the opacity. So to simulate like a cutout. So let's say we were trying to do like a, a very intricate uh, edge on this surface. We didn't want to model it. We could use an alpha texture in the opacity channel that's black and white to create kind of that cutout look. Uh, it's good for leaves and that kind of stuff as well. Um, so that's, that's the opacity settings. Uh, it works the same way with the diffuse material. And then we also have the smooth settings, which allows us to smooth or harden the facets depending whether that's on or not. And the edge is rounding, so you can see if I increase that, it adds a bevel to the material without having to actually model one. Uh, for realistic surfaces, you probably want to keep this to a very low value, like say that's 0.02 or 0.05 or something like that. You can see we get a slightly beveled edge, making it look a little bit more realistic, so a little bit less CG. And then below the um, edges rounding and the smooth settings, we have the film width, which allows us to add kind of like a colorized sheen to the surface. So this works really well if you're creating things like an oil slick or just a slight um, kind of color variation in the highlights. So the lower values are a bit more extreme, higher values are a bit more subtle. And then there's also an index of refraction for the film itself that you can adjust independently. You can see in this case, I have just a very slight kind of rainbow effect to the highlight or shifting the colors there. So that's the basics of working with the octane glossy material. In the next video, we'll take a look at the specular material.